have to admit, Bob, I'm pretty disappointed. You know, if you're 50 years plus of an investment experience, why didn't you get me into arm holdings the day before it went up 50 percent? I mean, you would think you'd have some foresight after all these years of investing people's money. Like, uh, you know, definitely, uh, definitely un 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 unimpressed, Bob. <laughs> what happened? Hey, Chris, don't you remember when I told him about Meta being up 200 or 20 percent the day after it happened? I've got a 100 <laughs> percent perfect record of calling big moves after the fact. That's why I'm so good at picking Super Bowl winners the following Monday. <laughs> I mean, but isn't it so obvious? Everyone knows that our artificial intelligence is the future and you know we should all be up 100% on our portfolios because of it already. Like, I don't get it. Why own anything else when you can own NVIDIA? I'll tell you what, guys. It's, it's eerily similar to what I went through in the late 90s, um, 2000. This is what you call a momentum trade. It's suddenly... There's, you know, there's nothing else to invest in, but the magnificent seven up, oh, it's only six now because Tesla's down 20% year to date. So it doesn't count anymore. It's been erased. You know, it's just like, it's been erased. It's been, it's been canceled. You now you got to, you know, now you got to start canceling these stocks as they <laughs> underperform. Well, our friends and our clients are our best indicators. And I, I've gotten many, many texts and phone calls about this, and including a text I got last week from uh, one of my good buddies. He said, more than one person is telling me to buy NVIDIA, QQQ. AMD, you know, should we be getting in on this stuff? Well, the good it's news is great. we are, um, you know, just don't have a hundred percent of your money there. It's like, you know, um, I always like to say, well, what do you mean? Like every dollar, you know, it's like, do you want to have every dollar in, you know, that particular investment? And, and I think if you got to go back and just think about, you know, history, using history as a guide, you know, go back to 2000, um, you know, we had this momentum trade in, you know, dot com stocks. They were going up every day. You know, people had that uh, fear of missing out. Um, and then, you know, literally within two years, you were down 60% um, where there was an opportunity of a lifetime and, you know, mass diversification, like like maximum diversification, which is what I'm recommending right now. Yeah, that's right. Because you saw the NASDAQ then eventually go down 50%, yet small caps, emerging market stocks doubled over that next decade. And you know you could actually see something similar happen over the next decade, but the problem is it's probably not going to be instant gratification because you know the one wild moves that's happened this year is instead of the the rally actually broadening out, you've actually seen it narrow again. You know it broadened out at the end of last year. All of a sudden, you saw a lot of these other asset classes or sectors move. Like we saw real estate finally go up. We saw small caps finally move. International markets finally moved, and then we come into this year. And it's all being funneled back into those mega cap stocks again and semiconductors. And it's just like all the caution has gone to the wind. I mean, when was the last time we saw a stock go up 50% one day, 20% in one day? We probably haven't seen that since you know the great dot-com bubble back in 2000. So it's kind of like it is becoming very, very similar in terms of the way the market's actually moving. Sounds very rational to me. It does. Sorry, a little <laughs> sarcasm there. <laughs> well, the but thing I mean, is, you know, it's like, we, meanwhile, the economy's, the economy's growing. Um, and you know, a lot of, a lot of things in, in, in the market and a lot of things in our portfolio aren't going to move until rates start to come down, uh, especially small caps, you know, they're, they're very sensitive to interest rates, real estate, obviously. Uh, but the valuations are so good. The dividends are so good. And this is what you've got to think about, you know, are you a gambler, a hedge fund investor, or are you a long-term investor? And, and if you're a long-term investor, you know, dividends are just as important as market movement. And the dividend opportunity today has never been greater. Especially if you're retired at this point, you know, cash flow is so much more important than long-term growth. I mean, you need you need that money today. You need it now. I mean, if you're just invested in these six uh, magnificent stocks, you know, they drop 40% and you have to take money out of your portfolio. You know, that's not a great situation to be in. Yeah, I was still talking to a client of mine the other day, Chris, and he bought a, uh, you know, he bought a couple of condos down in Naples and he said, man, they're up so big. But he said, but at our stage in life, why does that matter, right? He says, you know, I can't spend, you know, relative appreciation. He said, I need cash flow. Well, yeah, it's a great point. And we talk about this a lot, but like those cap stocks pay no dividends or very little dividends uh, versus what the rest of the market pays. So it does really pay, no pun intended, to have max diversification right now because you're buying a lot of cheaper stocks or valuations are cheaper, not to get too wonky. And they're paying a lot higher dividends. And right, if you're someone who's looking to be retired uh, soon or retired now, you need income. And we know longer term, a big driver performance of the overall market 
is compounding those dividends. That's why actually over time, tech stocks, growth stocks actually underperform the overall market. They have these really hot arrows like this, but when they go down, they get hammered. In the meantime, they pay very little in cash flow, which makes them actually less attractive as long-term investments. But it's hard to see that right now when you have growth doing so well and it's done well for a decade. So you think it's going well for a decade, it must continue this way. Well, these market cycles do come to an end. They come to an end before you know it. It's usually abrupt. Yeah, you know, I was uh, speaking to a client the other day. I was so excited about you know 2023's return on a large cap growth portfolio. It was up 45, 46, 47 percent. I forget which. And I said, yeah, that's great. Kind of made up for the 40 percent loss we had the year before. He goes, what? <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, you talk about volatility. You know, so now it's nice to see it's up a couple of percent. Now, meanwhile, you look at something like uh, our pipeline index. You know, that was up, you know, 12, 13 percent in 2022, up another 23 percent, you know, a little more consistent return. So, as you said, Rye, if you go over time, you know, go over a couple of years, you'll see that value typically does outperform growth. But, it, you know, growth sure is sexy right now. You know, it's like I, I wish I had all my money there right now. Um, but uh, I know better, you know, because history it's not just a guide. It's a great teacher. Well, you know, it's kind of like driving down the highway in a really fast car, you know, with your foot to the floor, but the sun's in your eyes. You know, you just don't know what the danger is ahead just because you're blinded by the light and you're going fast and it feels good. Sounds like I'd rather have a Volvo with uh, with clarity of sight ahead of me, Chris. Yeah, you parked that Aston Martin right next to it. I'm telling you what, you're not going to pick the Volvo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the other problem too is when you start calling tech stocks or these mega cap stocks defensive, they're not defensive. Yeah. You know, last time I looked just two years ago, uh, some of these stocks were down between 40 and 50 percent. That's not defensive. <laughs> so and it wasn't that long ago, but our memories tend to be short. We tend to look at all the great growth numbers in retrospect. Um, but we know the future doesn't typically look like the past in the short term. You know, whatever worked probably won't work in the future. Whatever didn't work is going to start to work. So to your point, Bob, max diversification is probably the best strategy you can possibly have now. You might you might not be rewarded right away, but over the longer term, you'll probably be a lot happier. No, the hard part is is it's you see these great earnings numbers coming out, but you fail to look at you know the company selling at ninety times earnings, thinking price is an issue, but it truly is. You know, I lived through you know ninety ninety nine two thousand, and you know everybody wanted to own these stocks, and they turned out to be great companies, but horrible stocks because it took. 15 years, you know, for the earnings to catch up to the valuation. And as you say, Rye, I hear these pundits now saying, well, these are defensive stocks. Well, nothing at 30 to 100 times earnings is defensive. And there's never been a time in history where anybody's been able to maintain that type of growth. So, you know, enjoy the ride while it happens. It's going to end poorly, right? As it always does, it ends in tears. You know, don't be late, be early. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 108, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially literally at any stage of your journey. Bob, Chris, and I have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. This is literally what we do every single day. But if you want a more hands-on approach, you want to get a better idea where you are financially right now, well, if you've saved over a million dollars for your retirement or financial independence, Bob, Chris, and I will run for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review we literally look at everything. There's no other firm out there that will do this work up front. We'll build you your own personalized financial portal, we'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll literally just hone in on every financial issue you need to address today, whether it's an income plan for retirement, how to take Social Security, how to draw from your portfolio without running out of money. We'll build a full dynamic income plan factoring in inflation. We'll look at diversification. Markets have been extremely volatile the last couple of years. Has your portfolio been all over the place or have you been sending in cash? Paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth. We'll show you how to do it with the least amount of risk. We'll tie it to your goals and we'll show you how to protect your wealth so you don't run out of money. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage products, structured products. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make. It's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. If you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. 
All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob and Chris, let's be honest. A lot of us last year, we probably put our head in the sand. We didn't address our financial plan because the news was terrible, right? Apparently, we were going to go into recession. Markets were going to crash. They're going to fall off a cliff. So if there's any year to make an excuse not to do your financial planning, it was probably last year. But the problem is none of that came to fruition, right? We didn't have a recession. Market didn't crash. So the question is, what do you do right now? So I thought we could talk about our blueprint for getting on track with your finances, getting right in the game, getting your financial plan up to date in the process of the steps you have to take to do that immediately. Well, you know, when it comes to planning, whether it's a big year, down year, good, good economy, good news or bad news, uh, the biggest problem is procrastination, right? It's, you know, and the problem with that is, you know, time passes and markets operate. Neither cares how you feel or think. So you got to get started right now. And I think the first step is you got to have a process, right? We call it the A to B process. And I think for everybody who doesn't have a plan, they got to start putting things together at point A. And Chris, what, what do you need to do to get, uh, you know, get together at point A? Well, the first place to start is you got to put together all your financial assets, 401ks, 403bs, IRAs, brokerage accounts, you know, everything that you have today, you got to pull all that together. Well, it's amazing too, whenever you do that exercise is most people don't realize, and you probably don't realize, you probably have assets you don't know about, you forgot about, right? Like maybe you have an old 401k from a job from 10 years ago. So by putting everything in one place, the thing I'm always surprised about is people don't realize they're probably worth more money than they actually thought <laughs> because they never added it all up. Well, it's a lifetime process too, guys. You know, like I'm, I'm, I actually collect a pension, um, which is amazing. And I remember when when my first or second year on the job, they said, oh, you're going to have this pension. I'm thinking, I'm 22 years old. When the heck, what am I going to need a pension? And I'm never going to be 70. That's like, I, and you almost forget about it until actually a friend of mine reminded me. And sure enough, when I called my old firm, they didn't have the right phone number, address. They had mom's date of birth wrong. They had my wedding date wrong. Um, you know, you got to stay on top of all these things. Wait a minute, Chris. So Bob has a pension. Does that mean we can pay him less at paying capital? Right. I mean, that's not fair. <laughs> He's already <laughs> between pension and social security. We can reduce your salary by that much, Bob. I think that's a great plan. You know, you guys work me like a dog. You pay me like a puppy. It's never changing. You know, I just can't believe it. I can't believe I put up with this. I love how Ryan's always so focused on the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's funny, like, you know, it's a lot like, you know, having these accounts, it's a lot like finding change in the couch. You know, I talked to a client of mine the other day and she said to me, have you ever heard of this firm, Alaris? Apparently I've got some money there. So we ended up calling Alaris and we found $20,000. Yeah, right. So there's, there's money probably out there. And then once you've gathered it all together, right, you put it in one place and this is where technology can be great because there's a lot of ways to build portals now where you can see everything in one place is you got to start thinking about income because it's pretty simple, right? When you stop working, that income, that paycheck stops. So where are you going to generate that income now? So you want to get an understanding of all the investments you own, whether you know it's real estate, it's stocks, it's bonds, how much income is actually coming in on your passive assets along with, to your point, Bob, do you, are you entitled to a pension, social security and get a real clear picture of the actual cash flow that'll come in when your paycheck stops, it's kind of a simple exercise, but a very critical one. And that's the bit that, and that's the most important point, right? You think like, okay, I got it all together, but really, what you have to do is you have to know what you own, and then the most important question is, why do you own it? And you know, I remember we I talked to the CEO of Merrill Lynch one day. I was talking to him about financial planning, and he said, "All I want to do is make money." And I said, "Hey, Dan, I'm sorry, but making money's not a goal. Why do you need to make money?" So that's point B, right? Why do you need money, guys? Why do you need to understand point B and analyze that as, as you do point A? Well, right. You got to know what risk you need, what income you need. And that's actually a great point right now. If you own a lot of growth stocks like Amazon, Google, NVIDIA, you own those big tech names, they pay no income. <laughs> so that might be a problem when you need income for retirement. So the investments do the, that you do own, to your point, Bob, do they actually correlate to the goals you're trying to achieve? And that's why it's so clear to you need to be clearly understand what point B is or what your goals actually are. And then you can say, well, it makes sense to own this investment or not own this investment. Well, the other part of it, you know, it's a mental exercise. You know, it, when you create goals that are based on your lifestyle, based on you and not based on some frivolous thing to say to make the most amount of money, you're a little bit more attached to that. So you're going to be more motivated to invest towards reaching those goals. That's so brilliant, Chris, because investing is emotional, right? If you're not emotionally attached to the return, you don't really care what the return is. Yeah, you know, why do I need to fix it? It's going up right now. I got everything in large cap growth. I'm a genius. 
uh, why do I need to fix that, right? You need to become emotionally evolved to your goals because it can change so quickly. And it's not just, you know, setting the goals today. It's also factoring in that insidious hidden tax, right? Inflation, because you do this on the back of an envelope, you think you're set. You start putting in those inflation numbers, it gets kind of scary. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And that's the biggest enemy you have when you're trying to plan for your income for retirement is it's going to double over the next 20 years. Your expenses are going to double just to do the same thing because inflation is real. And if you didn't believe inflation was real, just look at the last two years. It's up like 17%. Um, just go to the grocery store, right? Just go to uh, fill up your, your car. It's just have a tremendous amount of uh, cost adjustments and you got to continually factor those in over time. And most of us don't do that. You know, We have a mantra here is we want the surprises being the positive, not the negative. You really have to throw the kitchen sink at that financial plan to make sure it's going to work. Well, you know, the other thing too, and I talk about this a lot, is that most of us don't have a clue as to what we spend. Uh, I actually talked to a, a client of mine the other day, and he said, you know, if I really needed to, I could live on $35,000 a year. We went and looked at his financial plan. His mortgage alone is $35,000 a year. So I said, <laughs> yeah, you probably could live on 35000 but you're not going to eat. You're not going to put gas in your car. You're not going to send your son to college. So, you know, it when you you look at your expenses, just think about it. It's probably going to be a lot more than what you think it is. Well, I think I think that's one of the benefits and maybe some of the reluctance on the part of a lot of folks is they don't want an advisor because we make them accountable to these things. Like, well, you know, I could live on that, Chris. So I'm saying, well, you made X last year. Why didn't you save any of it? Where is it? Right. Is it under <laughs> the sofa? Is it, you know, is it in the sink? What would you do with it? Um, people spend more than they think they do. And you know what? We're really good at figuring out what that spend is. And yeah, you're right, Dad. I don't think anybody really wants to hear it. But you know what? It's like you got to do it if you really want to have a successful financial plan. Well, I think it's a rationalization because we think, oh, I'll be retired. I won't spend as much money, right? I need 80% of my income. And we can tell you it's probably not the case. You probably need 100% of your income. And the other rationalization is, well, well, then when I'm out in my late 80s, well, I won't travel as much. I won't have as much fun. That's not true either. You know, our clients well into their 80s are still out there going on cruises. They're spoiling their grandkids, living, you know, as they say, their best life. So you really don't ever assume you're going to spend less. It, you know, it typically doesn't happen in our experience. You got to plan for needing a lot of income in retirement. And most of us don't account for enough. And that could be a big problem, especially as you get into your later years. Hey, Ryan, I hear the reason, real reason dad's working is because he now has a grandchild that he has to spoil. That might, be, <laughs> that might not be true, but I, I don't know. Let me tell you about spending money. I was in Disney World with him last week. My goodness gracious. How do people afford to go there? <laughs> well, you know, Ryan, I think that, uh, you know, Taylor Swift has gotten a lot of credit uh, for the economic recovery from the no landing uh, economy that we've been talking about. But- Truth of the matter is, it's the baby boom generation that's spending a lot of money. They've accumulated a lot of wealth, uh, which just goes to show you what long-term investing does. It's not that they have any gifted insight any more than anybody else. But when you invest and save and compound on a plan, you end up creating wealth. And the baby boomers are out there enjoying their retirement years because they've accumulated a lot of wealth and they're spending. And that's why the economy, one of the major reasons why the economy is doing so well and why the unemployment numbers are so low. So you guys can thank me now. Actually, thank my fellow travelers um, and, uh, you know, enjoy the ride. All right. The hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. Bob, more young adults are living with their parents. Among adults under 25, 57% live with their parents, up from 53% in 1993. About 59% of parents said they help their young adult children financially. Hint, hint, this past year, um, released Thursday by Pew Research Center, uh, focused on adults under 35. Well, Bob, um, don't be shy. You know, help your grown children with their uh, finances. You guys, I'll be happy to have you move in uh, back into the house. Uh, you can live in the basement. Oh. <clears throat> My two homes don't have a basement. Sorry, guys. Got a nice crawl space, though, down in Ocean City. <laughs> this goes back to, too, what's going to keep the economy afloat, too, is a lot of baby boomers do have money, um, and they are going to give a lot of that to their younger children so they can spend it as well, which is actually a boon for the economy also. It's going to be a gigantic transfer of wealth, guys, over the next 10, 15 years. Also, just another fun fact in there, too, uh, Gen Z employees will overtake baby boomers in the workplace this year. That's kind of crazy. Or maybe disturbing. I don't know. I know. But you know, watch the financial news. They still think 
those folks are, are living on the couch in their, in their parents' basement. It's amazing how successful this generation is and what a big part of the economy they've already become. Yeah, time, time flies whether you're uh, having fun or not. So <laughs> Chris, China produces more electric vehicles than the rest of the world combined. Domestic sales jumped nearly 40% last year. Internal combustion car sales may disappear entirely in China within five years, according to Gav Gal Dragonomics. That's kind of a crazy stat. Yeah, that's an incredible stat. But, you know, here in the old good US of A, electric car sales are only up 8%. So don't worry, Dad, you can keep uh, burning gas for the foreseeable future. <laughs> I will say this, though, just uh, walking around New York, it's just like all of a sudden, out of the blue, you see Teslas everywhere. And you didn't see Teslas driving around New York a year ago. And I can tell you, like one in six cars now, it just is like my own observation, tend to be a Tesla. Like, it's amazing how quickly... Uh, Teslas have become adopted on uh, on the bi coastal cities, but you're also seeing a lot of other cars too, like the uh, the Chevy Evo. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of different types of electric cars on the road, more and more every day. Well, I hear this argument: well, people in the Midwest just aren't buying them, and I was like, well, when was the last time that we were actually following trends from the Midwest for the future? <laughs> Bad joke. Sorry for all the people in the Midwest. <laughs> well, they're not buying them in Ohio, but uh, yeah, last time I looked, Ohio didn't invent the next. Uh, all right, never mind. <laughs> they right. Our car companies were started in the Midwest. Fair point, Bob. Fair point. Okay. It's been a long time since they've been at the heart of innovation, but now I'm going to get a lot of hate mail. All right, Chris. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. Um, the drop to about $182 in Tesla's share price this, uh, two weeks ago saw short sellers make more than $2 billion by betting against the stock right before the company's earnings report according to financial analytics firm Ortex Media. Wow. Shares of Tesla are down 27% so far this year after more than doubling in 2023. Yeah, I guess uh, sometimes it's better to be short, not long. Well, it just shows you the risk of speculating in, in high PE stocks, right? Um, you know, when the sun's shining, it feels so good, but when it goes against you, it's so fast. So it's, it happens slowly. And then suddenly, I think that's what Hemingway said about bankruptcy, but uh, it's amazing how volatile these stocks can be. And suddenly you don't hear about Tesla anymore as one of the magnificent companies. It's a magnificent bust so far this year, but year is young. Still magnificent. I think that, by, that Bob's just uh, quoting Hemingway, just says our podcast is going to a whole new level. So <laughs> well done, Bob. Well done. <laughs> well, another great episode. Hope you enjoyed episode 148, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, hopefully love it. Please give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Put a comment underneath. Let people know how great our podcast is. You can subscribe on Spotify. And this is YouTube right now. You can like this video, subscribe to our channel, click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. Your support gives us the ability to continue to do this podcast. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.